All right, here we go. We are in unit two, lecture number three. If you have not printed off your notes to follow along and take some notes and write some questions down, please pause this and do so right now. All right, we're moving into the English colonies. Now we started off, we're starting today off with the fact that Spain has been defeated by England. England is looked at as being a new world superpower and they need to come to America and colonize to get rich just like everybody else has done. So we start with England's first attempt, which is in Roanoke, which is off the coast of North Carolina. It is not permanent, which means that it doesn't stay, stick around for too long. If you look down here, there is a recreation. You could go visit it today, and they've recreated what it looks like back then. Uh, back in April of 1585, they send 108 soldiers. So the English are just like the Spanish, sending soldiers first. And right away, as soon as the soldiers land, the Indians notice that they are, that they are soldiers, and there is a fight the English return back to England within a year of 1586. They come back in July of 1587 with 117 colonists this time, men, women, and children, which makes it look more peaceful. So the king kind of learned his lesson and sends colonists this time, not just all soldiers. I'm sure there were some soldiers in that group, but they brought a little bit of everybody. And don't forget, soldiers. Okay. Uh, moving on, the elected leader is a, a guy named John White. He returns to England to get new supplies. Again, the English, just like everybody else coming to America, is not ready to survive the New World. And the English need new supplies. They're not surviving very well. So their leader returns back to England. And he doesn't come back for three years to August of 1590. And the reason behind that is that the war is going on back in England between England and Spain. So once that war is finally over, John White comes back to Roanoke to notice that no one is there. It's missing. Everybody's gone. There's no remains of anybody. There's no skeletons. There's no sign of any kind of fight. There's just nobody there. It's like a ghost town. And still to this day, we don't know why the people left or where they went. There's a couple reasons. The only clue is this little clue here. The a gr Somebody had carved Croatoan or the name of the local Indian tribe on one of the posts for the the fence almost or the you know, wall that's built around the area. So we know that that's true, but we don't know if the people assimilated or went with the Indians or if the Indians came and wiped them out. We just know that it was unsuccessful. Uh, moving on to the second big colony, or colony for the English, they have Jamestown, which is settled off the James River in Virginia. This is a permanent settlement. It will be there forever. Uh, this The English don't come back until December of 1606, so almost 10 years, or 17 years. This time, they get again, first they bring men first, 144 of them. Within two years of fighting, or within two years of living there, between fighting and disease and everything else you could possibly have. So for whatever reasons, they're not surviving. But after, between cold disease and starvation, they're not, they're not surviving. So only 38 out of 144 survive. The group that sends these men there are the Virginia Company of London. So this is a joint stock company where people buy in to a company and owners have stock. So your parents may own stock today. That means they own part of that company. It's a joint stock company. And the colonists, just like you guys with your projects, were given 10,000 square miles by the king, called a charter, just like what you're filling out for the colony project. And there is an aerial view of what Jamestown would have looked like. And when they get there, it's low, swampy land. And they have mosquitoes that back then carried something called malaria. That's bad for you. Uh, they don't have good drinking water either. It's like kind of men or marsh where if you went, you'd have to like kind of scoop your hand around stuff to get to the actual water, which still wouldn't be that great. And because it's mostly wooded, this is a picture at the end of Jamestown, but, but it's mostly wooded and most of the men have to get there right away and clear out the woods. They actually have to cut down all the different woods or all the different trees. And most of the men were too lazy to do that. They were businessmen. They were there to just look for gold and get super rich. Uh, the results of this happening is that most of the survivors that are still alive, they run out of food, they have nothing left, they're eating cats, dogs, rats, anything else to survive. And you have this guy over here. You have a man named John Smith who steps in. He is the captain of the army and his idea is we need to work together, we need to work hard. So his new rule is no work, no food. If you don't work for the good of the colony, the, the colony will not provide you with food. So if you're lazy, we're not going to give you anything. Uh, right away, the colony starts to do a little better. And the king sends women and other boats 
with more people on it to boost the spirits. So boys, you're pretty easy with this. When girls walk by and you want to impress them all of a sudden, hey, we want to cut down trees, we want to be awesome, we want to show off for the girls. So you guys kind of get that. And of course, the girls pretty much just laugh at you anyway. So moving on, uh, that winter when these new settlers show up in 1609, 500 total settlers are in Jamestown, but only 60 survive the winter, and it's called the starving time. Again, they, they choose to eat anything they can to survive. And the Indian, the local Indian tribes, the Powhatan Indians, actually come to the gates of the wall, or come to the walls of the city of Jamestown, and drop off corn and other things to survive. The Indians actually feel sorry for them, even though they've been kind of warring with each other back and forth. The Indians agree that they can't just watch these people die, so the Indians actually provide them with enough food to survive the winter. What changes Jamestown is a man named John Rolfe, and what he does is he brings over a plant called tobacco, and the tobacco seeds are actually illegally smuggled into America back then, and tobacco needs a low marshy area to survive and to actually grow, and lo and behold, Jamestown is that low marshy area. So they find out that tobacco is a huge money maker back in Europe. Nowhere in Europe can they make tobacco. So all of a sudden in Jamestown, different areas of tobacco start popping up, different areas where they're growing tobacco. At first it's just little parts of a house, like a little garden, and it starts growing into huge plantations where they need or they will need indentured servants or slaves. So back then tobacco was seen as a cure for headaches, other different problems because again the nicotine made you feel a little better. Today we know that's not exactly true. We know that tobacco is bad for you, but back then they looked at it as, hey, it's a cure for lots of diseases. And we again know that is not true. Uh, moving on to the E! True Hollywood story of Pocahontas, not the Disney version. These, this is a picture or recreation from a modern movie to show you what Pocahontas could have looked like. Here's a picture of her when she's married to John Rolfe, the t Mr. Tobacco. And then here are pictures of her, paintings of her throughout her lifetime. There's her as an Indian princess, Indian princess, and then when they actually take her to England and change her kind of lifestyle. Now she is the daughter, one of I think it's like 70 daughters for the chief of the Paladins. And according to John Smith's personal autobiography, again, he wrote this autobiography, uh, she, John Smith writes down that when he's about to die, the Indians actually capture him and blame him for Jamestown. When he's about to get destroyed by the Indians, or they're going to kill him, she jumps on top of him and says to her dad that she loves John Smith and she wants to help him survive. Now again, this is John Smith's autobiography. We don't know if that's exactly true. But it is according to the guy who wrote his autobiography. So what happens is John Smith actually has a little gunpowder explosion accident. And he looks a little different and has to go back to England to get fixed by doctors. Now, she ends up marrying John Rolfe. Is it a marriage of love? Who knows? What we do know is that by John Rolfe marrying her, the Indians do not attack Jamestown, so it works out well for him. He brings her back to England to show her off as a money-making thing, actually puts her in a cage to sell tickets for people in England to see this Indian princess and this savage princess. And along the journey on their way back, she catches smallpox and ends up dying. Now, when he gets back to America, John Rolfe is totally sad. He gets the fake, fake tears going on, and he, of course, tells the Indian chief, I'm so sorry she died. I loved her so much. I can't believe she's dead, but I just hope that our, our groups can work together for the good of the colony. That's what Pocahontas would have wanted. And, of course, <laughs> boo John Rolfe. During this time period, they bring over indentured servants who are kind of like slaves, but they're actually people getting out of jail to work for a certain number of, of years, three to seven, to get out of prison. Instead of staying in prison in England, you could come to America, work almost like a slave on land, selling tobacco or growing tobacco, and after that amount of time, three to seven years, you won your freedom, and you got to be in America for free. You got to go on and live your life being free in America and not being stuck in prison. Uh, after indentured servants start dying away, or once the idea starts dying away, once the people stop coming over, Africans are turned to as being a new group of slaves. So instead of indentured servants, slaves are free. We've talked about the triangular trade route, and that kicks up. In Virginia, now that it's growing as a colony, a, the first representative form of government by Europeans here in America is formed. It's called the House of Burgesses, where if you were an adult free man who owned land, you got to vote on issues. So it's sort of a kind of take on modern-day democracy. 
Now, the Indians' conflicts come up, or when the Indians attack, it's because when the Chief ends up dying from old age after an old time, he's almost, I believe, 90 when that takes place. When the Chief dies, there's no tie keeping the Indians from attacking Jamestown. And when he does pass away, the Indians come in and try to destroy Jamestown. They kill 350-plus settlers, including John Rolfe. And the king sees Jamestown as being so important because it's making lots of money that he sends soldiers to help defend the colonies. All of a sudden, the colonies become very important for the king of England because the colonies are making him money. So you have Bacon's Rebellion on the bottom, which we'll go over one more time later, but that's just where a bunch of ex-indentured servants who are living on the frontier, right where the border of the colony is with the Indian land, that the indentured servants are upset that even though they're English, they're not being treated or protected by the army of England. And the leader of this group is called Nathaniel Bacon. And he and other indentured servants or ex-indentured servants rebel and actually almost take over Jamestown. They burn it down and Nathaniel Bacon dies during this. But again, it proves to the King of England he needs to keep his, his people at bay here in America. He needs to kind of control them with different measures like that. But he needs to control them for his own greed, for his, you know, for the necessary thing that he's going to make money off these colonies. Now, here are three major reasons why people come to America. You have religious reasons. So people came to America to get out of, or to get religious freedom, to practice the religion that they were coming over to. And this goes over the Protestants and Catholics and Puritans, Separatists. And there's an area called the Great Migration where 16,000 Separatists come over in 10 years. You came over for political freedom to get away from your king. If you didn't like the king, you came over to America to get away from, you know, the different problems the king was having, where kings were getting beheaded, like King James and King Charles, or wars were breaking out because of the religion of the king. So you came here for political freedom, to be free, to maybe have a chance at democracy. And last and most importantly is economic freedom. People came to America to make money, to start over, have a new life. Now this is true 400 years ago, and it's still true today. People still come to America to start over, start a new life, and be successful. Uh, going on really quick, you have the idea of the pilgrims. We all know them. We celebrate them in, in um, November. And the pilgrims come from America, or come from England to America. They are separatists. They're actually a Protestant religion. And they get money from a Virginia company of London again to come over, led by a guy named John Carver. But they are sent to Cape Cod, Massachusetts with their charter. They actually are lost and land in Virginia or they land, they're supposed to land in Virginia, sorry, and they land near Cape Cod, Massachusetts, so they're outside their charter. They have to make new rules, and when they write their new rules, it's called the Mayflower Compact, where the men, 41 of them, said that they were going to vote on things based on majority. So just like democracy, if more than half of you agreed to it, it's a law. They settle in Plymouth, which was an ex-Indian ex village. It was actually, the area was cleared out and set up as a village where all the Indians died and were wiped out by disease. John Smith actually mapped that out. What happens is most of them, again, die from just not being ready for this new winter, this horrible winter that they have. And what happens is that Indians, Samoset and Squanto, two Indians coming out of the woods who can speak English because of Squanto's being captured as a slave and going to England. He had done this in his lifetime and then came back. And Squanto teaches the English how to survive, how to use fertilizer, which is actually ground up fish, to plant corn and survive. And actually these Indians help the people of Plymouth survive the winter. And what happens is that they celebrate the first Thanksgiving, which is a result of a huge harvest of food. The, the colonists survive based on the Indians helping them out. So the governor, Governor Bradford, calls for a nine day long celebration of all the extra food. So all the extra food they've made that they can't store for the winter, they're going to eat for nine straight days. It's kind of like the hot dog eating competition for five straight days. And what happens is that they celebrate with all this extra food, their food is venison or deer, fowl, shellfish, corn. They don't eat turkey. Turkey wasn't where they were yet. They didn't call it Thanksgiving. This wasn't an, a holiday for them. This was just a, they were giving thanks to the fact the Indians had helped them out and giving thanks that they had this food to survive. So this was a successful colony due to the Indians actually helping the Americans or helping these settlers from England. Again, hopefully you took some notes and we'll see you tomorrow.